four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, the show where a couple of friends get together and watch an episode of Transformers Generation One and then get together and talk about and reflect on what they saw. Uh, my name is Jersey Drozd. I'm a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is Hoover's back. Hoover's back for episode two. And episode two of the first miniseries, More Than Meets the Eye. Part two, written by George Arthur Bloom. And here is the uh, Cliff's Notes log line for the episode. Well, Cliff's Notes? I don't know if this would be Cliff's Notes. It's just more like it's the summary paragraph at the in the Netflix entry. Um, the Decepticons try to gather every bit of energy that they can from Earth in order to get back to Cybertron. The Autobots, along with their new human allies, try to stop them. It's pretty vague. But it gives you the gist of it. That's what's going to happen in this episode, right? Simple enough. It's only 22 minutes of animation, so it can't be too long. <laughs> there's a lot of... I've got some notes on. There's a lot of good animation in this episode. There's some really lovely shots and some stuff that they just didn't do ever again in this series. <laughs> <laughs> it set the bar pretty high in some places that it's like, yeah, let's not do that again. If we remember from last week, it ended on a cliffhanger where Optimus and all the Autobots were stranded in burning water uh, <laughs> on a collapsed oil platform, and a bunch of poor little humans are all trying to stay afloat, and Spike and Sparkplug are trapped by this gigantic piece of, what is it, like, it's like a girders, like metal. Yeah, like a steel metal. girder or steel beam or something. And Optimus can't lift it, and he's like, try to keep your head above water, and then we get start this new episode. And of course, the Decepticons have gotten out of Dodge with their newly discovered uh, Energon cubes. Which which is like, I, I was realizing that this and the following miniseries, The Ultimate Doom, mm -hmm. it follows that that pattern pretty pretty well. It's like the, the, the first two skirmishes, the Decepticons always win by like a, a substantial margin. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like they, they, they don't just win, they super win. They win and like all the Autobots look like they're going to die. And then like the last episode, the Autobots like pick up the pace and turn the tide. But, but yeah, that's where we left off. Megatron and his buddies all fly away. The Autobots are left in burning water. And so we start this episode with one of your favorite characters, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> well, we have a little Autobot who I think we might have like seen in the background in the first episode, but didn't really get any airtime, and that would be Huffer. And Huffer is also trapped under the wreckage of the oil platform. But luckily, here comes another Autobot we may have also seen in the background, but didn't get any airtime, and that would be Braun. Huffer is voiced by John Stevenson, and Braun is voiced by Corey Burton. So we've already heard uh, these guys in the show, but now they're doing different guys. Yeah, and John Stevenson doing an uncharacteristically high voice for yeah. his characters. Yeah, totally known for a gravelly thundercracker type guy, but now he's doing Huffer! <laughs> I love Huffer. <laughs> I love that these two guys are two of the, the on their file cards, they're two of the strongest Autobots, and they're yep. these little tiny guys, right? Yep. I, I think that's that really grabbed my imagination as a child. I think it's also a gift to poor kids. It's like, oh, I got the second strongest Autobot, and I only had to pay three ninety nine. dollars <laughs> Maybe. I wonder if that was part of the logic behind it. I, I just, I, I also just wonder, I mean, Bob Bidiansky wrote all the file cards for these first guys, right? If I'm not mistaken. Pretty sure, or at least like the broad strokes of them. Bob Bidiansky, Marvel Comics writer who wrote the, the first like 50 something issues of the Transformers comic in the United States, for, for Marvel Comics at, at least. And it just, it feels like a very Marvel-ish thing to say, let's take the smallest, most like look at look at the brawn toy like even his arms are like these little dinky arms right uh it's like what if he was like the second strongest guy on the team right that just feels yeah. like something marvel would do but brawn comes up so uh huffer's trapped and he's like my arm i can't get it out and then bronze comes swimming over and we hear his voice for the first time and it, it's this stands out the, mm -hmm. the this performance uh compared to later performances of brawn doesn't it yeah, it's it's not nearly as deep. It's pretty gruff and a, a manly type voice. But later, when we hear Braun in subsequent episodes, it's going to be a lot deeper. Like, I'll get the door. But, <laughs> but here, it's like, great, you pick the right place. 
<laughs> he sounds like more, yeah, more of like a gruff lummox in mm-hmm. this. Whereas his performance later on is more like stereotypical oily bodybuilder guy voice, right? Like <laughs> like handsome guy on Three's Company, like character who walks in, <laughs> like hello everybody, I'm a very strong man, you know. <laughs> He has like a bit of more smarm to his performance later on, but this one he just sounds like big, like big gruff guy, right? Mm-hmm. And something else happens in this scene that's going to happen a lot, and yeah, again, lot. this happens more in this miniseries than it does later on. And it, mm-hmm. this was one of those things that just made my little eleven-year-old brain just like spark. Um, he his, he holds up his arm, and his fist slides into his forearm, and out comes another device. Yeah, a little welding torch. So. Braun is going to rescue Huffer from that metal by welding him out, essentially. He cuts him out, and he's like, ah, thanks, Braun, let's take off. They just fly up into the sky, <laughs> which is still weird to see. But then Optimus calls the trail breaker. He's like, hey, trail breaker. Now we get to talk to another uh, Autobot who we haven't spoken with before, right? Mm-hmm. He was in the last episode. He just didn't say anything. And trail breaker is Frank Welker. Also, like Braun, he's got a special little deal underneath his hand, his hand retracts, and he can project a force field with that. Mm-hmm. And, and he's like, take a shot at that fire with your force field. He's like, all right. And then Wheeljack's like, oh, I'll give him a hand. And Wheeljack does, he, he pulls his <laughs> hand into his forearm, and out comes a fire extinguisher. Yep. All these Autobots have, like, special powers, oftentimes in their hands. And... Strangely, it's, they're pretty much going to disappear after this first miniseries, much like their flight capabilities. But I have a theory on that. Would you like to hear my theory, Jersey? Uh. <laughs> Is it surprising so- that Hoover has a theory on some story aspect of the Transformers cartoon? <laughs> this I've, it, we're only in episode two, and I already feel like this is going to need a jingle. But yes, go for it. Give I us, would give agree. Us <laughs> Do we have any fans out there who would like to make me a uh, Hoover's theories jingle? <laughs> Let's hear it. So, what if these special devices in their hand are powered by cybertonium? And as we see uh... in a few more episodes from now, they start running out of cybertonium. And they have to go back to Cybertron to get some. So what if now that they live on Earth, it's sort of viewed that, okay, these are using a power source we don't really have ready access to. So maybe we should stop using them all the time and only use them when we really, really need them. That's just Mm. my theory. You see any holes in that? Uh, no, except that it makes me, uh, click my tongue at Ratchet for not having them checked out earlier. Like when they, all of a sudden it's like, you know, it's like Jazz, I noticed that you're not using your grappling hook hand as much as you used to. Mm-hmm. Um, can you, I think you're due for a checkup. Let's find that. Cause like early detection, you know, <laughs> <important>. that's true. <laughs> so, so like, why did they wait until Power Glide's head fell off his body to go like, <laughs> oh, that's right. Cybertonium. <laughs> Well, as the Autobots have proven, none of them are all that great at their jobs. They're basically struggling to keep up. These are just a bunch of blue-collar guys who've been forced into the war, so they don't know any better. Well, that that gets into one of my fan theories that we could talk about later. But I I do love how like you're automatically showing your bias. So it's like, oh yeah, these guys kind of suck at their jobs. Uh, But but yeah, I think this. I think. Regardless of what reason, I think one of the things that, again, as a kid, it was so interesting. And I, I remember noticing this and remarking on it. It was like, wow, it's kind of like science fiction meets superheroes. Yeah. Because each of them has their own special power. Wind Charger has magnetism. Um, as we'll discover later on, Mirage can disappear. You know, Everybody has a special ability. And then they have these extra abilities in the sense that they can retract their hands and make something come out of their forearm to do something else. So the transforming happens all the way down. It's not just the fact they can turn to another vehicle. They can actually like change their bodies in different ways to meet other needs, which is uh, pretty cool. At least this kid thought it was really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's it'd be enough, you'd think, that, okay, this robot turns into a vehicle or something else. But no, on top of that, they have a special ability. Yeah, so Jazz throws his grappling hook hand across the the, the way, and Optimus grabs onto it. And Jazz like pulls Optimus and the humans up back onto the platform. 
and then like Spike and Sparkplug climb off Optimus's shoulders, and and Sparkplug turns to Optimus like, I don't know who you are, but you saved our lives. <laughs> and and to which now it's like, okay, well these are beings from another planet, so they uh, obviously not speak, you know, a <laughs> language descended from you know German and and uh, a variety of other Western European languages. But he, although the, but sure the enough, assumption here is that they're either Teletrend 1 or their onboard computers or something have basically determined the local language and have them uh, speaking it because they have no problem being understood by the humans. So s some kind of Star Trek-y goodness is going on there with that. Although it doesn't stop Optimus uh, from speaking <laughs> stiltedly to Spike and Sparkplug. <laughs> to me, it sounds like he's speaking to them just like an English speaker is trying to communicate with someone who can't even speak any English. He's speaking louder, <laughs> and he's gesturing. He points at the sky. <laughs> We're Autobots. <laughs> We're from space up in the sky up there. I don't know who you are, but you saved our lives. We're Autobots. We're from Cybertron. A planet far from Earth. Another planet? That's awesome! Those who tried to harm you are called Decepticons. We must stop them before they destroy your world. Can we help? We are the only ones who can stop the Decepticons. But my son Spike and I know more about Earth than you do. Hmm, maybe you can help us. <laughs> Me, Optimus. <laughs> Yes, he hits his chest. <laughs> you Vo small is the me toilet. big. <laughs> you small me big. Because <laughs> they need him to point that out verbally. <laughs> Eventually, I know that we will uh, ultimately expose your college comics about the Transformers in which Optimus is uh -oh. a horrendous monster of a person <laughs> and, and, and it holds everyone in contempt all the time and so like is this was this what your first clue of that the way he spoke to spike and spark plug maybe maybe not <laughs> all right so he talks to them another planet that's awesome <laughs> so i gotta go home and write in my diary right now <laughs> Dear Diary, time is of the essence. You must learn about my new robot friends right now. The Autobots are a highly advanced form of robot. I don't really know if they're from the past or the future, but they can think and have real feelings. So he doesn't know if they're from the past or the future. <laughs> Why, why does this line bother you? <laughs> I, I love that so much because it's like, why can't they be from the present? It's like, wouldn't that be like the assumption since they're there right now and talking to oh, him? Oh, that is like, incredibly Buddhist of you. <laughs> <laughs> Live in the now, Spike. <laughs> I don't know about that, but it just it just seems a weird thing to say. Like, Like, you don't meet some strange creature and go I don't know if they're from the past or the future <laughs> it's like why are you even I, I don't understand it's like why are you even assuming either one it's like okay maybe maybe they let on that they crashed here a long time ago so they're like oh maybe they're from the past but I mean <laughs> are you just saying they might be from the future because they're robots and they're highly advanced. Yeah, they're I talking mean... robots. They're talking robots. I, I, okay, I'm chalking this up. And of course, this is me always retconning all this, this <laughs> thought, but it, it, it's like kid logic, right? Like a kid, it, he, he's talking like how a child would talk. Like, oh, they're, they're talking robots. Are they from the future? They have to be because we, our robots don't talk. You know, all I've got is this Radio Shack pair of feet that I put an inflatable <laughs> robot in and then I can make it go around the room. That sure isn't, that doesn't match what I'm seeing in front of me. So they must be from the future. Or, but if they came from a long ways away, maybe they're from like the distant past. Because I, I remember seeing an episode of Cosmos where he talked about how fast light can go and how in time dilation. So therefore, maybe they're really ancient. <laughs> you just have to defend the humans every chance you get. <laughs> 
I went through my period of Spike hatred when I was a teenager, and now I love Spike so much. <laughs> and I love his earnest voice, and I, I love listening to his thoughts as he's writing in his diary. And I love that he, you know, starts, he closes his diary. He's like, well, time to go back inside. Hey, I found a tape deck. <laughs> <laughs> This was the 80s when lots of cool things were just lying around and you could just pick them up and take them. It's before we had laws. <laughs> and I, this is this is the first time we see Soundwave transform, I think, right? Yep. We ever since they got on Earth, we don't know if he's still a lamppost or or something else, but we have only seen him in robot mode on Earth. So unless you were privy to the toys, you might not even know what this thing is at first. That's true. Good point. I do like, too, that, like, and this is a necessary thing they have to show. They have to show him turn into the tape deck so we know that when Spike picks it up, it's it's not a good thing. But I like that it's, like, just giant robot hiding behind a big rock watching a boy write in his diary. <laughs> that, 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 that feels so silly and it's so wonderfully silly. Like, Soundwave is, like, he's turning to, like, laser being, like, shh, don't make a sound. <laughs> he's writing in his diary. And, and he, he's thing. trying to keep himself from laughing. He thinks we're from the past or the future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because so he would he would be really hung up on language the way you are because he's a Decepticon. Uh, so Spike picks up the, the tape deck and goes running into the base. And I just want to take take a moment to say, like, if anybody's watching the episode it, to like listen to her her thoughts on it, this is a moment to freeze on. And like, just as they it, it pulls back to this wide shot of him running into the entrance of the base, it's just there's something that this period of animation had that I feel like we don't see as much anymore, where the backgrounds are like painted in like gouache or acrylic, and the foreground characters are well, they were printed onto cellophane and painted. Right, the line art was printed on cellophane, and then the uh, the paint people p- p- painted in the colors in flat colors. So the characters stand out a lot more uh, and read a lot clearer because they're all in flat colors. But the backgrounds are usually really rich, and especially in this miniseries, these backgrounds are really pretty. And this one, like, there's this really lovely complementary color scheme going on with the the golden colors of the rocks, followed by like the bright blue shadows, and then the 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 dark browns inside the base as he's running inside. So, just worth taking a moment to like look at some of those. Those little pieces of art. The artist in me gets really excited when I look at that stuff. Yeah, which one of us is the artist, kid? See if you can figure that out. <laughs> Jersey's like, so, oh, the the spectrum of colors they use and, and the gosh and the different kind of paints. And and then Hoover's like, yeah, Soundwave's spying on him. He's funny. <laughs> Soundwave's cool. He's got little people inside of him. <laughs> So Spike, Spike, he's he's done writing in his journal. He's running inside the base, and what does he do? He like takes his tape deck, and then like just sets it on a shelf. It's like, well, I'll get back to that later because, understandably, he's got sentient robots to have conversations right. with. Right. <laughs> you, usually, finding a cool tape deck would be the highlight of your day, but when you've just yeah. met sentient robots, it takes a back seat. So he's like, I'll I'll deal with this later. So he sets it right down by Teletran <laughs> one. Yeah. And he wanders into the old folks' home part of the arc <laughs> and uh, starts talking to Hound and Mirage. Okay, can we pause just because you said that? And I just want to make a note on this because like, this is something, too, that I feel like this miniseries, G.I. Joe also had this a little bit. Um, I, I guess also Visionaries had this, too. Now that I think about it, a lot of Sunbow shows had this. But like it doesn't happen as much anymore. Is that the the majority of good guys in the series are voiced have like voices of older people. Mm-hmm. And what I mean is like people over forty five, right? Hound sounds like he's probably in his like mid to late sixties. I, I, I'm I'm not talking about robot years of people. I'm just saying like the, <laughs> like when I conjure somebody in their mid to late sixties, like say from. Mayberry or something, right? Like that's what I, like that's what you can picture. Hound his his Earth equivalent, right? Braun sounds like a guy in his like maybe late thirties, early forties. Mm-hmm. Uh, Huffer clearly is in his late fifties, early sixties. Uh, Gears, even Windcharger, Windcharger, who's like a character who is like he's a, he's a sports car. Yeah. And when you think about that, a sports car character in today's animation, you would automatically put like a young guy's voice, somebody like Chris Pratt's sure. voice in yeah. him, right? Um, in the later incarnations of Transformers, the speedy characters are usually voiced by young, mid-range vocal. You don't put like somebody like John Stevenson's voice in a, in a sports car. Right. So 
And now as a kid, this fascinated me because the power fantasy I wanted to have was being the person at full power, full development. Adults have this magical power that they know what decisions to make and when. Right? They are not. Par- <laughs> at, least, at least that's what we thought as children. <laughs> yes. From a kid's standpoint, an adult is not paralyzed by indecision. They just right. know what's right and they know what's wrong. The example I always use is like I was riding in the passenger seat of my parents' car. My dad was driving and I asked him, how do you know how to stay in between the lanes? Like, how do you know how much to turn the wheel? And he's like, I don't know. I just know. But to me, it looked like a superpower. He just mm. knows. Right. So like the old characters like that, not like Cup, like Cup and Hot Rod is a different thing. I feel like that's the dawning of like the time we're in now where you have like old guy who's like, oh, shut up, old man. And then young guy who's like, yeah, I got a high voice and I'm cool. Mm -hmm. But like all of these characters like Hound and Mirage, I was all in on those old guy voices. (laughs) Well, Do you think it might have been like partially reflective of the times, whereas like the voice artists at the time... A lot of them had been in the industry for a while and were sort of like the old guard in a sort of way. And they're probably, they probably outnumbered the number of like youth in the industry. Do you think that's the case? I don't know. Because Peter Cullen was like in his 30s when he did this, right? Mm. Frank Walker was in his 30s when he did this. And like you do have some higher voice characters like Rumble. Right. But he's Mm -hmm. not that high, but he's got like youthful voice. Skywarp has relatively speaking youthful voice. But um, and Bumblebee, Dan Gilveson, uh, youthful voice. But so the the actors must have been there. But I wonder if it was just something where I wonder if Wally Burr had anything to do with this. too. Mm. Right. There's another there's another piece of the puzzle. to figure. Yeah, we haven't talked about Wally Burr yet. So let's talk a little bit about him. And how he was the voice director of the show. So basically, he was calling the shots. He was getting the performance out of the voice actors. And, uh, you know, if if all the stories are to be believed, he was... What's a nice way to say tyrant? Taskmaster. (laughs) Taskmaster. Okay, that'll work. Uh, He... You know he was loved by the voice actors, but he could he could drive them crazy because he had an idea of the performance in his head, and he was determined to get it out of the voice artists. So some of those right. uh, voice acting sessions could go on for a long time with him going, "No, sound sound a little more panicked when you say that." Things like that. <laughs> so I I think, in my estimation, that made this show and a lot of the other Sunbow shows that he worked on so much better than a lot of the non sunbo shows like listen to an episode of mask don't watch just listen to an episode of mask and then listen to an episode of gi joe or transformers and i think you can instantly tell the difference yeah yeah sadly and and this is one of those things where when i talk with people and they find out how much i love these cartoons and they're like oh yeah well you know what they don't hold up i'm like well first of all hold up to what second of all it's like that that assumes that everybody else everybody working on it was just hacking it in and i don't Mm -hmm. think they were just hacking it in i think everybody was actually trying to do their very best on this stuff Mm -hmm. um at least wally burr like by all accounts i've heard multiple interviews with people who worked with him and like yes he was passionate to the point of absurdity at times so yeah, so it's it's hard to say why this first season featured like so many throaty older voices. You you do have Michael Bell who can do a great youthful voice with Prowl and uh, Sideswipe, right? Right. So you got Sun, Sunstreak and Sideswipe are youthful characters, but they don't really figure much into these this first miniseries. We're really focusing on a lot of the throatier guys. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, Spike's talking to Hound and the throatiest of all throaty Autobots, Mirage. <laughs> Howdy, buddy. <laughs> Uh, so yeah it's like uh, oh and Trailbreaker right so like why do you transform well disguise and it beats walking I'm like actually I imagine it does (laughs) it would be cool to be able to like be on wheels and move around a little bit faster and and as they're walking to Hound and Mirage I do want to note that have you ever noticed I'm sure you have that the, the walking sound changes between this season and the next I don't think I ever have. I mean, definitely the walking sound is very prominent in in most of the episodes. I guess, you know, yeah. it's like they're robots. They're they're going to make a little clink clank when they walk. Yeah. 
Um, so if you listen carefully in this first mini series, their their walk noises sound a little bit different. It sounds like I was trying to I was listening carefully and trying to pin down like what do I think they did use to make that sound? Like I'll, I'll bend bird about it. Um, it <laughs> sounds like if you took like a big canvas bag and filled it with a whole bunch of loose tools and just like kind of like gently dropped it on the ground. There's like <laughs> there's like the sound of metal hitting up like a bunch of loose metal hitting a bunch of loose metal, but also kind of a gravelly noise. Is it like if you're dropping it onto like say like a, a gra- like playground gravel, mm. that that that. Whereas in season one proper, the sound switches to much more of a clanking noise. It's it's more of a, it sounds like you're banging on metal when they walk. Mm. Um. So I I I don't know if that's interesting to anybody. It's just it's something <laughs> that I noticed and, and like and I do have a preference for this walking noise. <laughs> <laughs> So if you ever see Jersey in a line at a Transformers convention, go up to him and he'll probably be saying, so what a, What Transformer walking noise do you prefer? <laughs> I like this first miniseries. And then the people will look at him strange and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have been at so many dinner gatherings of cartoonists where I've ruined things by stuff by talking about my feelings on Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, so they uh, turn the corner and there's Hound and Mirage. Oh, and actually, don't we do like a quick pan over and we see like Ratchet's like working on, he's like fixing somebody and like Sunstreak and Sideswipe are just like sitting there in vehicle mode. And then, and then Spike here wants to know how he transformed Hound, and here we get like the old joke of the the acolyte going to the master, like how do you, how do you be perfect? <laughs> you know, it's like like this. Yeah, so Hound and Mirage have a little bit more elaborate uh, superpowers. It's not just some dippy little thing in their hands. Uh, Hound can project holograms, mm-hmm. like he demonstrates and uh, shows a little translucent driver in his car seat. And then the Mirage can totally disappear. Man, that's a, that's a lot better than a welding torch hand. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, it, this goes to one of those like personality profiles. Would you choose flight or would you choose invisibility? What does that <laughs> say about you? We know what Mirage is all about. Uh, but like, I, like that, I like the special effect of that cube that forms over him mm-hmm. and then he vanishes. Yeah, that's very cool. And the cube cool. has to come back. It, it's, yeah, it's really, I think it's, it's very imaginative, right? Because they, they could have just had him fade. But I like the idea of like some kind of field forming mm-hmm. around him that renders him invisible. Um, but disappearing, that's the best disguise of all. <laughs> so meanwhile, Soundwave, now that he's in the free, now he's in, he's in the clear, nobody's around, he transforms back into robot mode. And uh, we actually get to see Ravage eject this time. Yep. Yeah, we see that Ravage has been a little cassette buddy of Soundwave's. So... Uh, meanwhile, Hound takes Spike out for a drive, and that leaves Soundwave to download the Autobots MP3 collection via Ravage in Teletran <laughs> 1. So it, it's the cuts are really weird. It's like Hound goes out with Spike, and they're literally they're literally gone for the timing of one conversation that's like two or three sentences long. And then there's like a wipe and Spike is back in the headquarters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like we just need to get them out of the way so Soundwave can do his stuff. Well, there's a nice there's a nice character moment with Hound here. And and also this miniseries sets up like the 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 buddy relationship originally was Spike and Hound. It wasn't mm-hmm. Spike and Bumblebee, right? Yep. Which later on it becomes Spike and Bumblebee, but this miniseries is like suggesting that these two are going to be good friends. And I like the line where he's like well, tell me about Cybertron. I don't. I don't want to talk to you about Earth because the Hound's like, "Oh, tell me about Earth." He's like, "No, tell me about Cybertron." And Spike asks Hound, "Do you miss it?" And he's like, "Sometimes." You know, it's like another one of those like little lines. And this is like that economy of storytelling that Sunbow cartoons have is like that line tells you a lot about Hound. It tells you that like, well, he's not really super committed to this war. He loves Earth, and he would just as soon go disappear into the world and just be an Earthling than be caught up in this war, right? Mm. Because, like, Huffer, on the other hand, I mean, they did a whole Marvel comic about how homesick he was. Like, oh, I got to get back home. I got to get back home. Mm-hmm. So just, I, I just, I love that. That line hangs with me. Do you miss it? Sometimes. You know, if, if you asked Mirage, like, every day. Yep. Right? So, yes, while they're out, you know, dune buggying it, 
Yes, then Soundwave puts Ravage. Ravage transforms into cassette mode and inserts into Teletran 1. So, like, what I like about that, too, is it's suggesting that, okay, this cassette technology is something that is not our cassette technology. This is something that, you know, is a is a Cybertronian. That that's why they turn into those things that go into sound waves. Just it's it's an espionage tactic, mm-hmm. having an alt mode that they turn into a data collecting device, which is that's pretty cool. And yeah, he's like, go uh, acquire every acquire all knowledge that Teletran One has about Earth's resources, right? Then Soundwave transforms back into tape deck mode, and Spike comes home. Now this is another like piece of art that I wanted to point at, not to talk about technique, but more to talk about this is something that we see in the first miniseries, maybe like the first twelve. 13 episode first season but we don't see it as much afterwards is remember the autobot base is the arc that crashed into this volcano which means that parts of the ship are not going to be in perfect functioning order right and in the first season the first miniseries too you see a lot of corridors in the ship where like mountain has blasted through like the mm-hmm. hull you know yeah. and like you see smash screens and you just see like giant uh, stalactites just smashed through the ceiling, right? So it's like, I love that look of this pristine gold, you know, futuristic spaceship base with all these screens all over the place mixed with the the catastrophe of damage all over, you know, the parts where it crashed, reminding you that they're they're inside a volcano, you know? Mm-hmm. I, yeah. And I don't know why, like, later on, you don't see that as much in, when they show shots of the base. Yeah, all the Autobots have a function on their file card, be it commander or medic or military strategist, but no one was housekeeper. So all these broken screens and everything are just going to stay that way. However, in season two, they get an architect on the team, and maybe that's why we don't yeah, see that anymore. Right now, Haller's in Europe <laughs> getting a British accent. Yeah. And he's going to come back with a new name. So maybe once he gets back. <laughs> That's that's why that's why the base is fixed. I never put that together. Oh, okay. So Spike comes back and he sees the tape deck is doing something, and he sees Teletran One screen is doing something. He's like, "Hey, what's going on here? Th- this would be pretty freaky, right? A little tiny yeah. pocket tape deck turns into like a, a thirty foot tall robot who, and with no face. Who are you? <laughs> and Soundwave takes a swing at him. Yeah. So yeah, he he runs to the wall and jumps up and, and and there's another nice little thing they didn't have to do is that he runs to the wall to hit the alarm, but he has to like jump up in the air with both mm-hmm. arms raised over his head to hit the button. Nice little thing, just suggesting like, okay, remember you're a child in a world of giants, right? Yeah. That's pretty cool, imaginative play. And then hits the alarm and Soundwave just turns around <laughs> and bolts out of the place. Oh yeah. my gosh, you gotta get out of here. It's like and and. This I, I think you need to talk about this is that he doesn't just go like, all right, I'll see you later, Ravage. I'm out of here. <laughs> right. Okay, so Ravage is still in tape mode in Teletran 1. So Soundwave's running away. He's like, Ravage, let's get the yeah. heck out of here. Not a direct quote. And then Ravage ejects and runs at, runs behind him. So the Autobots, it, it looks like a, like a basketball game where it's like people are trying to block Ravage and then Ravage is trying to get around him. And, uh, but so like all the while, Sunrise running away going, Ravage. <laughs> and then Optimus sees Soundwave and mm-hmm. doesn't recognize him yet. Optimus is a, a wise leader. He has... The wisdom-inducing matrix of leadership in him. So the matrix, using... which is the receptacle of all Autobot mm-hmm. past leaders' wisdom. So, like yep. once an Autobot leader passes into the the All Spark, their intelligence and knowledge goes into the matrix, which the new leader gets to carry to mm-hmm. enhance his wisdom. So, how does this help Optimus in this scene? There's some debate whether Optimus has the matrix even at this point, but. Regardless of that, Optimus uses his wise knowledge as a commander to say the following. A Decepticon. Get him. <laughs> so it's 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 he's being economical in his words, right? He doesn't have to be, you know, loquacious and, and effervescent about like you know tell, get, rallying his troops. Just like bad guy, mm-hmm. um, bad guy, stop him. <laughs> <laughs> See, Grimlock would make a good leader. Okay, so then they uh, they all start chasing Ravage, and it's like trying to catch a cat, which is, I don't know if you've ever tried it. It's not the easiest mm-hmm. thing in the entire world. 
And then they they do something with Ravage here that is on the file card. And I remember comparing notes on this because I was like, wow, that's weird. Because like he just like Ravage goes in the shadows and the Autobots complain, I can't see him. <laughs> And if I remember right, on the file card, it said something about he has the ability to disappear into darkness or something like that. Yeah, I think uh, that sounds familiar. Again, it's like, uh, I think it was Bob Budiansky wanting to instill like a certain power into every character that uh, mm-hmm. they had in addition to, you know, their transformation abilities, probably because he had a very uh, comic booky background. Well, I think he also knew how to write for young people and like just mm-hmm. a simple expression like that, just like it sparks the imagination. Wait a minute. What? He can he could disappear into darkness. That's a cool. I, that's a cool ability. I could I, I can come up with a lot of different play scenarios with that. So. So, yeah. So then we find out some more superpowers of some of the other characters, right? Yeah. Gears is instructed to use his infrared to find Ravage. So. Basically, he has a spotlight thing that comes out of his top of his truck, and then it turns red, and that's suddenly infrared. (laughs) That's all infrared is, kids. It's just a spotlight that is red. That's infrared. This is before we got to the G.I. Joe episodes where they kept saying, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, the building blocks of all life. Like, they they weren't trying to teach us anything at this point. It's like, infrared, it's just, it's red. Just make it red. We don't have to explain to the kids how infrared works. (laughs) (laughs) And then Jazz and Prowl use net hands to catch Ravage. So they have nets come out of their little wrists. Pretty cool. Like, they each launch half of it, and then, like, it comes together and catches Ravage. So Ravage is caught, and Soundwave clearly is expressing emotion over Mm -hmm. his little buddy being caught. It doesn't stop him from from getting away, but... Right, but it's, 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 it's once again, it's just adding up to what a weird character he is. Like, any of the other Decepticons, like if it was Thundercracker and Skywarp... And Skywarp got captured. Thundercrack right. would be like, well, whatever. You look real geeky. <laughs> I'll see you later. You know? There would be, like, no remorse. Right. But, like, with Soundwave and his tapes, there's something, mm-hmm. right? And I, and just enough. Like, that, that's the other thing about this series. Like, they, they don't go into a lot of depth with anything, but they leave right. just enough information and breadcrumbs to get you to imagine and wonder about it. And I keep coming back to this idea of like, I think what made it resonate for me as a kid was it gave me just enough to begin my own imaginative speculation uh, mm-hmm. and, and the sort of like fan creation about the series. Yes. So. For sure. And Sokka says, we got him. And then it cuts right to Soundwave reporting on, you know, what information he got. Yeah, Soundwave recorded the Wikipedia entry on Sherman Dam for Megatron via Teletran <laughs> 1, so he's playing that for him, and uh, uh, strangely, sounds like Casey Kasem. Because <laughs> that's Teletran 1's voice. <laughs> uh, Megatron's like, all right, good work, Soundwave. But then Star Trek's like, oh, but that's not enough! <laughs> that's not enough power! <laughs> like, like, he's like, oh, we got Sherman Dam can produce this much electrical power. Megatron's happy about it. But then Star Trek's like, but I don't get it. <laughs> Starscream can't just let a Megatron plan go uncommented on. <laughs> Impossible for him. Uh, and so the Megatron says a, another, I think, fairly famous line, at least between us. We've used this line a lot between uh, the two of us. It gets quoted a lot is uh, your knowledge is only overshadowed by your stupidity, Starscream. <laughs> Yes, Jersey tells me very often that my knowledge is only overshadowed by my stupidity. And then Hoover turns to the camera saying, you think I should be the leader, right, kids? Right. (laughs) (laughs) And no one cares. there's no one watching. (laughs) No one's recording me. I'm not on a TV show. Uh, but so he's like, well, we're going to make, we're going to make a tidal wave and, you know, send enough water surging through the dam and it'll boost the electrical output and we'll make energon cubes out of it. So, so what happens next? Well, the Decepticons, uh, head to the dam and in addition to the regular three seekers, we all know and love, they have a lavender one with them. Mm-hmm. And if you go by the sort of collective fan canon, this one has been named Hot Link by the fans. Oh, interesting. And, uh, yeah, they've come up with names know. for quite a few of them. We'll see some more Seekers in a few episodes from now that also have names, but uh, this little purple guy, 
Uh, oftentimes we see more than one of them, but this particular color scheme is often referred to as hot link. So when they land here, I did notice that the animation changes slightly. I don't know if you picked up on this, but it, it feels like I got handed off to a different team just for this one scene because like mm. everybody moves a little bit more than they normally do. Like there's a lot of movement in this show. Like actually when Optimus is commanding gears to activate his infrared, there's a really nice little shot of Optimus like coming around the corner. Mm -hmm. And like he does a lot of a lot of there's a lot of unnecessary animation that they did to like give it like a lot of fluid movement where he feels really big and heavy. This scene, it feels like like when when Soundwave ejects Rumble, Rumble like does like this backflip out of Soundwave's yeah, chest when yeah. it lands on the ground. Very cool looking. And then Soundwave is like, you know, Rumble activate pile drivers, Operation Tidal Wave, and he yeah. gestures a tidal wave with his arm. <laughs> <laughs> it's like he's breakdancing all of a sudden. <laughs> And then when, when Rumble jumps in the water too, like he does like there's like a lot of extra splashing and stuff. It's it's not Pinocchio, but it's <laughs> it's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. And so Rumble goes, swims underwater and then gets to the bottom of the dam and we see him use his pal drivers for the first time. His arms turn mm -hmm. into these big battle ram things, starts pounding on the ground. Water's agitated. And continue on with like the observations about movement. Megatron does this little like you know he's hunched over and he like he's like gra grasping his fist and he's like shaking it with with, with happiness. <laughs> he's like, ah, excellent, it's working. You know, <laughs> it's another thing that they, they you will not see again in the series is that kind of like little emphasis on character uh, gesturing. So the water starts rushing over the dam, and what happens next? We cut to the humans inside the dam, and. What we previously know about humans based just on this show. Let's see what examples we've seen. We've seen, of course, Spike and Sparkplug. Yeah. But then there was Joe and his friend we saw last episode. I don't understand it, Joe. Some, some real smart guys. Yeah. And now we get uh, some more smart guys in here. Hey, Ed, look at this cage. It's going crazy. Something must be wrong. So yeah, we go inside the, the the hydroelectric plant at the dam, and it's just like there, there's these guys like uh, standing in front of a bunch of they look like meters, like uh, it's like a needle meter, right? And mm -hmm. like there's like a big section on the right that's red, right? <laughs> and the needles are all in the red, <laughs> <laughs> which is as children, it's like that's all we need to know. The needles in the red, we don't even know how to read gauges yet. You know? <laughs> so the the needles are all in the red. The humans are looking at it. Yeah, hey, look at this gauge. <laughs> They're like, hmm, needles shouldn't be in the red. What should we do? Let's smack the gauge. Maybe the gauge <laughs> is wrong. Let's hit the gauge until it's right again, and then yeah. we'll proceed with our lives. <laughs> uh, and then that great John Stevenson line with, the river's rising! <laughs> <laughs> And then, like, we cut back to Autobot headquarters, and Jazz and, and Sp Spike are just like watching Teletran One, and like all of a sudden, this 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 news report comes in that that there's a problem with Sherman Dam. You know, that could be Decepticons, so we'll tell Prime. And then we cut back to the dam, and this is another lovely piece of animation <laughs> where we just see like all these little humans like scurrying about the uh, the, the the hydroelectric plant and all of a sudden like the wall just cracks and mm. then it cracks again there's a dude on a catwalk who's like what the heck he's like right in the middle of where the cracking starts he runs off to the side and then boom the wall explodes <laughs> Megatron just walks through the wall essentially <laughs> boom talk about making an entrance I just I what I like to imagine is the moment just before that where it's like okay well we got to go in how do we get do it Megatron's like watch this guys <laughs> <laughs> should we come through the ceiling through the window should we like blow up a wall no 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 watch this watch this this, this is how much contempt I have for these people <laughs> sort of walk through their little paper house and then he shoots out the ceiling. And it, he at least gives them the dignity of telling or introducing himself, right? Mm -hmm. and you're going to do exactly what I tell you. And we see those terrified people. <laughs> and so once again, we get another uh, command from Megatron to Starscream. Starscream, prepare the null ray. So again, Starscream, prepare the null ray. Not use the your null, null ray. ray on the things. 
not fire the null ray, not blankety blankety blank. It's prepare the null ray. Okay. Prepare the null because it's not your null ray, Starstream. It belongs to the <laughs> state because this is a tyranny. Peace through tyranny. <laughs> There's no you don't own anything, Starstream. Yes, this is the eighties. Right. Communism was bad. <laughs> so uh and then and then we cut back to that that first guy who was like something must be wrong and he's like he's like uh, we gotta get out of here it's gonna blow and then we see the the water uh like cracking the dam and we get like the you know the the crescendo of dramatic music and then fade to black our commercial break is this our this is our first uh first one of the episode uh, yep. yeah first cliffhanger so eh, as cliffhangers go, this one's not quite as dramatic as when Hound fell off a cliff. You know, I just felt like, okay, the dam's going to explode. What does that mean? I don't know. Mm. And, and and furthermore, yeah, there's some humans that are jeopardized, but if the dam explodes, won't that take out Megatron? Wouldn't that be a <laughs> good thing? I don't know. Nothing but, can take out Megatron. That's true. That's what Rumble said. <laughs> um, He's merciless. <laughs> that was pretty good. <laughs> Rumble, Rumble auditioning for the young ones. Um, so we come back from commercial break, and then uh, we, we go right back to that guy. He's like, I tell you, it's going to blow! <laughs> a human trying to reason with the giant robot he just met. <laughs> this whole place is going to go sky high! Now, there's a, th- this shot, I'll try to describe it for audio, but people should go back and watch it. It's a pretty wide shot. Like the human is like maybe only an inch tall on the screen. You know, like we're we're, we're seeing Megatron's full body standing next to the human, right? So the human's pretty tiny. But there's a lovely piece of animation here where the human, when he says, I, "This whole place is gonna go sky high," he throws his arms straight up in the air, and then Megatron leans in toward him and says, "Perfect. The electrical output is at its peak." And when he does that, when he leans down, you actually see the person wince. They like they they uh, flinch away from Megatron, and like you, this. This animation is such that you can't even see the person's face because they're so tiny, but they still manage to put in that little tiny gesture. They didn't have to. Mm -hmm. Were we really paying that close attention? I wasn't, but when I watch it now as an adult, I'm like, that's nice. That 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 it makes me feel like that person's more of a real person now. Hmm. Now the electrical output's at its peak, time to make some energon cubes, and there's a recipe that we always have to follow. (laughs) Which Soundwave has copyrighted, so don't try to steal it. So again, Megatron uh, requires Starscream's uh, community null ray. Starscream, activate the null ray. <laughs> and he shoots, pachoom, 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 and sound wave. Uh, prepare the energon cubes, and reflector goes up and starts filling the energon cubes. And quickly, quickly, and then we cut to outside, and the Autobots land outside the dam. Mm-hmm. Autobots show up on the scene, and again with the Autobots a great command of knowledge and and wisdom uh, Prowl is a military strategist he knows everything about plans and and how to how to uh, conduct a military operation so Prowl's wisdom in this situation is you think the Decepticons did this <sighs> I don't know why you have to like just <laughs> wave your anti-Autobot flag around. So maybe he didn't see the side of the wall that Megatron blasted through, right? Like he, he's There's he's a assessing giant this Megatron from a distance. S- shaped hole in the side of that dam. Do you think that the Decepticons did this? <laughs> it could have been. It could be a natural event. You don't know. Oh, they don't know about Earth. There might be Megatron-shaped holes everywhere. <laughs> That's true. They don't know about Earth. So I think that that was prudent of Prowl to allow for other possibilities. <laughs> so, but then, but then yeah, like, as soon as he's like, uh, you think the Decepticons did this? Blam! Like the wall explodes behind them. <laughs> and then Megatron's <laughs> like, it's 300 yards away. And he's like, yeah, try and get me. <laughs> <laughs> he's just trolling them. He only comes out to give them sass. <laughs> he does. Because he goes right back into the base after that. He's just like, ha ha. He's just Nelson Muntz. <laughs> That's exactly what he does in that scene. Oh, yeah. He just comes out, takes a pot shot at him, and goes back inside. You're too late, Prime. Sorry. I'm going to go inside and have my energon cubes now. Bye. <laughs> And then we cut to another part of the of the scene, and like there's uh, Spike and Hound together, and they're by the river where all this agitated water is happening. 
And Spike surmises, like, oh, it looks like this is where all the bad stuff is happening. And Hound says, only one way to find out. So Hound is going to go diving. But before, a little uh, little mask goes over his face so so he doesn't drown when he swims. <laughs> I guess. Because they breathe, maybe? I don't know. I guess. But well, uh, Rumble didn't need I one mean, when he went underneath. <laughs> Okay, time for time for <laughs> for uh, a Jersey theory. You know, Uh-oh. like those uh, military vehicles, like those Hummers that that are like su- fully submergible. They mm-hmm. have to have like this giant pipe that comes out of the top of the the engine block that that can go above the water because like the engine can't work if water gets in it. So maybe Autobots do exhale the way engines exhale. Mm. So he doesn't. Whereas Rumble is a tape, so he's not a car. Mm. Okay, I'll allow it. Check and checkmate. <laughs> so, I don't know. It just looked cool too. I I love that when he dives underwater, the the little like middle spot of his helmet lights up to make a flashlight. He's got this cool little diving mask. But th- this is the other thing about the animation I want to notice uh, note in this one is that this is the only time when we do an underwater scene where they like did a completely different color scheme for everything. Like mm. Hound and 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 uh, it's it's all monochrom. Uh, yeah, it's monochromatic, right? It's like or rather like uh, duotone. Where yeah, it's almost like a blue sh- sort of tint has been overlaid everything. Yep. And later on when they do underwater scenes, everybody just got their base colors on them. But this scene they actually like and they did a lot with like bubbles and like distortion of the water to really make it look confusing when they start fighting. Mm-hmm. Um and so Hound finds Rumble and there's this lo- other lovely part where we actually see Rumble uses pal driver for something other than hitting the ground like he kicks uh Hound in the knee with it. <laughs> 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 which is like that's pretty intense man he made an earthquake with those things and now he hit the poor old man in the knee <laughs> dirty pool rumble it's a cool looking fight i mean d- despite the fact that it's only about maybe like 15 seconds long if that all told yeah so hound and rumble are tussling in the water whereas ironhide and bumblebee have to deal with the rampaging river so they go off mm-hmm. and uh we hear Ironhide tell Bumblebee, Stop talking, tighten your shock absorbers and get in. We're gonna make a new river. And this is one of the reasons that Ironhide is one of my favorite Autobots, because he is a humble minivan. And I do mean minivans are humble. If uh, <laughs> I, When I was in high school and I was going on dates, my parents had a Ford Aerostar. That was the car I picked up uh, dates in. And... It is not like there are other guys in my class who had like Camaros, right? So mm-hmm. like you you roll up in a rusty old Ford Aerostar that like a bunch of your siblings have been in and it smells like fast food. It's got a bunch of toys on the floor, you know, like there. It's so like when I think of Ironhead, I'm like, wow, he's like a real hero who turns into a minivan and like Ironhead, how do we solve this problem? We're going to make a new river. Yeah. <laughs> No, shouldn't we evacuate the people because this is a natural disaster? No, we're going to change geography. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he's got a can-do attitude, so he's going to do the impossible, <laughs> and they pretty much do. Oh, it's a great scene, and I do love the ending line where it, they drive past the house where all the people are sitting on their roofs, <laughs> and the one guy says, Thanks, Thanks neighbors! neighbors! <laughs> like, they just thought it was a couple other humans, like, making a river. They didn't like realize that they do. were just saved by giant robots. <laughs> oh, that's such a great scene. Yeah, I, I do love that line so much. Oh, thanks, neighbors. Um, I'll have to remember that if I'm ever in a natural disaster. Okay, mm-hmm. so uh, they make a new river, and then, then the Autobots burst into the power plant to stop Megatron. Megatron says, gather the energy on cubes, return to base. Stick it in neutral, Megatron. You're not going anywhere. Try and stop me, Prime! The first of many vehicular puns that I love in this series. <laughs> and and he delivers it in such a John Wayne-y kind of way, right? This is like that one line where it's like a real... The John Wayne uh, influence really stands out. But, yeah. Yeah, we, we see that Megatron and Prime have... You know, this isn't their first rodeo. You know, they've they've yeah. been battling each other for a long time. They, yeah. they love taunting each other. They know where each other's buttons are. <laughs> well, yeah, they, 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 they give each other a hard time, right? Um, 
and then we also discover how big this power plant is because all the Autobots and Decepticons sort of like start hiding all over the place and start shooting at each other. And much like last episode where people were squaring off, it's like here's this Autobot versus this Decepticon, and and these guys are down this hallway, and then these guys are down this hallway. Mm-hmm. And there's that scene with Mirage and Cliff Jumper where Mirage is like thrown off of a of a a, a catwalk, and then like what was it Thundercrack and Skywarp converge on Cliff Jumper, and then Mirage flips up into the air and like sort of hits them both in the head with his feet, yes. and they both they fall off the catwalk. And so Megatron and, and Prime are fighting on this weird plank that's sticking out of a giant tower. I'm like, where was this part of the, the power plant? But that's okay. <laughs> it looks cool. And uh, Optimus gets, he's like hanging onto the edge of it and Megatron starts squishing his fingers with his foot. He's like, oh, nobody, nobody can stop me now. Not even you. Apparently going to knock Prime off and he's going to fall to his death. But Starscream is ever playful. <laughs> The way he was playful when he shot at the Autobot base. Yeah, but uh, what doesn't make a whole lot of sense here is that maybe Starscream has used all the energy of the Null Ray or something because he's armed with a slingshot. Yeah. And we never see this. We've never seen it before, and I don't think we ever see it again. (laughs) So he's got a slingshot, but it fires like kind of like a grenade sort of uh, projectile. It's it's a weird little thing. Yeah, why does he have a slingshot with like a little energy glowing energy grenade thing? Um and we can retcon all we want, right? Like it's like and that was what I was saying with him being playful. It's like, okay, well maybe Starscream is being like he's holding his enemies in such contempt, right? Like he's not even gonna use his his community null ray on anybody. He's not even gonna use his full lasers on anybody. He's gonna hit him hit him with a slingshot. Here's one Starscream's been saving for you. Yeah. Uh, he's been saving it in his back pocket where he keeps his slingshot. <laughs> one last spit in your eye before i before i leave um but yeah so then he like he hits like he fires and like i don't, I don't even know who he's shooting at because he blows up the the damn control computer and like starts a fire in the place and <laughs> yeah. which knocks megatron down and you know megatron can't say starscream's name without screaming it so he says so long autobots Here's one Starscream's been saving for you. You fool, Starscream! Help save the Energon cubes! Get them out of here! Follow me! And all the Decepticons are gathering up all of those weird Energon plates. And now we get to probably one of the top three most iconic scenes between Optimus and Megatron. Like, this... I would love to unpack with you if you if you care to like why this scene is so darn iconic because like a lot of toys get made where they're using these weapons. So we've seen other Autobots with with the weapons and uh, various devices come out of their hands, and now we learn that Megatron and Prime are no different. And Prime has this uh, sort of orangey golden axe hand, while Megatron has this glowy purple mace hand. So it's mm-hmm. it's very uh, visually interesting, um, you know, so they don't always have to just shoot lasers at each other. It's a way for mm-hmm. them to have uh, almost like gladiatorial style combat. Visually, it's just interesting and it offers another way of fighting. Of course, the original toys didn't have any of these, but in subsequent releases, like with the Masterpiece line and whatnot, they've always been sure to include them. Uh, it's just yeah. kind of a neat little add-on thing it's just interesting to me that this one stands out so much right like so like i recently a couple years ago i went to hoover dam in nevada and like i took some pictures while i was there and i shared them on social media and like the first things that some of my friends said to me was quoting the lines from the scene which we'll talk about in a second and i'm like yeah just the, the very fact of standing on a dam in the desert makes people think of this fight between optimus and megatron with the axe hand and the 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 mace hand but I would submit that, and we'll talk about this when we get to these episodes later, like Fire in the Sky, there's a pretty awesome gladiatorial fight between Optimus and Megatron where they do some really imaginative stuff, yet, like with crystals, right? Yet Mm -hmm. the toys are never released with like crystal weapons, you know? It's like for some reason, these two weapons, and I agree, they're very visually interesting. 
And it provided some really cool animation where they're swinging at each other and there's like those traces of the color of the weapon flying around them. But yeah, it, it's interesting to me that there, there were other very imaginative battles between those two, yet like uh, the toys haven't reflected that. It's like this seems to be the one that everybody remembers. Them fighting on top of a dam as it's about to explode while they have energy, you know, axe and, and mace. But also in this fight is we find out the way to get under Megatron's skin. <laughs> You're old, Megatron. Yesterday's model, ready for the scrap heap. We'll see who's ready for the scrap heap. Chuck, that's what you are. Chuck. Silence! So, yeah, uh, Megatron is not only about tyranny, he's about, he's anti-ageism. <laughs> Again, it's like these guys have been battling for ages, so they know exactly how to get under each other's skin. It's like they they don't just insult each other and move on. They they try to cut so deep as to actually cause mental anguish in their opponent. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he's trying to shake him up because yeah, Megatron is a pretty you know he's a pretty powerful dude. So if he can get him a little worked up, maybe he'll fight sloppy. But yeah, it's 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 one of those things where it's like, don't quote that in the playground. That's not going to get you very far. Junk. That's what you are. Pow. <laughs> you <know? laughs> you're not going to work up your enemy with that one. But apparently on Cybertron, that is like that's that's just nasty. You know, we, we don't say the J word on Cybertron. <laughs> Silence. Uh, <laughs> that's right. He does. <laughs> uh, so then like it, it's just like him just swinging at, op, at Optimus that fight continues on and then we mm -hmm. cut back to Spike who's worried about Hound and hey, hey this is where I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna give some props to the humans because like there's roiling water it's causing a tidal wave a dam's about to explode there is a robot way more powerful than you at the bottom of that river he hasn't come up yet what are you gonna do I'm gonna go help him yeah. Right, that's bravery. That's courage. It's, it is. I can't argue with that. Spike's not even old enough to drive yet. That that is a line of dialogue from one episode. So he's got yep. it, it, it. He's at his oldest. He's fifteen. Right. Yeah. What a guy. <laughs> Goes in after Hound. <laughs> but then, uh, oh no, he doesn't go in yet. Right. Like Rumble comes out first. Right. And he's like, he's like, where's where's Hound? And Rumble's like, get out of here. She doesn't even talk to him. No. <laughs> Just pushes him down. Push him. He grabs then, him by the throat. That's right. Yeah, cool. It's because Spike Not tight him. enough to make him silent. Just, just, no. just loose enough so he can still scream for help. Yes. And now we get to another. If we're keeping count, this is the second time, right? Yes. Help! Help! And then while Spike is. Screaming Optimus, and this is one of the recurring themes of the show, is that Optimus, is even even if he's as powerful as Megatron, even if he's got Megatron emotionally shaken up by calling him dirty words, he <laughs> still is, is always hamstrung by the fact that he cares about everybody. And when he hears Spike call for help, he instinctively looks over his shoulder yeah. and Megatron whacks him. Bonk. Right into the river. And then Megatron's like, ah, who's scrap metal now? I'm going to fly away with all my Energon cubes. And because I'm Megatron and I'm, I'm going to enjoy myself as I do it, I'm going to keep on swinging my little mace in the air like a <laughs> propeller as I fly away and, and do my devilish giggle. And now Optimus is rushed away by the river and he's never seen again. And the Autobots they shall lose. remember him. And No, that's not how it ends. We go to a commercial. And then go to we're commercial. Back. And... We see Optimus is splashing around, and Jazz pulls out his grappling hook hand once again. Yeah. And now we get a little bit of Cybertronian slang, <laughs> like like bodacious and radical and tubular. What do Autobots say when they're really excited about what's happening? Hi, Charlie Prime. You did it. And so then we cut back to Spike, who's like sort of recovering from whatever Rumble did to him. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's like like Rumble like, grabbed his shirt and then like Megatron flew away and Rumble's like, all right, later for you. Yeah, I'll just push <laughs> you down again and then fly away, I guess, because Spike's still alive. And he's like, he's like, oh, my head. And he's like, Hound, are you down there? And he dives into the water to save Hound. 
And he finds Hound buried under all this rock that Rumble left him under. And then Spike moves the rock and then gestures like, hey. Uh, <laughs> we need to go up. I can't breathe under here. Yeah, yeah. And Hound, like, turns on engines or something, gets him out of there really fast. And then we get to another famous scene where he's pumping the water out of Spike. Well, he's basically got him over a rock and he's basically like pushing on his back. So it's almost like the Heimlich maneuver. <laughs> I guess. I don't know what he's doing there, but, but yeah, he's like, he's like, he's, he's helping Spike get the water out of his system. Uh, easy Spike. You almost flooded your engine. How about another piece of uh, Hoover Fannin? Are we ready for that? Oh, I am. This is pretty much the last time we see Spike hang out with Hound. <laughs> so maybe Hound in his in his attempt to save Spike cracked a couple of Spike's <laughs> ribs in the meantime. <laughs> so I mean Hound, I gotta stay away from that guy. Yeah, he Hound needs had a, well, but Hound was very <laughs> very noble in saving Spike, but uh maybe Spike came away with some collateral damage. He's like, oh, I'm hanging out with Bumblebee from now on. Yeah, he's he's not as he's not as strong as Hound. So if I ever need the Heimlich maneuver, I won't die. Right. <laughs> uh, maybe that that's an interesting theory. So I didn't realize this is the last time we see them together as friends, like as as like good buddies. I think. Yeah, you could be right. Um, and so then you know, okay, the battle's over. Autobots are re- collecting themselves, and we cut to Mirage. And Mirage says a line that if I were the human in the room, I'd be like, "Hey." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I really like it though because I mean they've they basically been on this planet awake for I guess a couple of days, if that. Uh, mm-hmm. So Mirage is like, why don't we just leave? <laughs> let's, let's go home. <laughs> yeah, you know, why don't we just go back to Cybertron and forget about the Decepticons? And then and the, and the Optimus also says a line that would make me say, "Hey." <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> he says we can't do that. If they if they're successful here, they'll be impossible to beat on Cybertron. Um, humans, <laughs> we're in jeopardy. <laughs> yeah, but the Decepticons will really make a mess of things if we let them win here. And now we get to a line that caused me to write my own fanfic, and it's it comes from Huffer, your favorite character. Maybe we should repair our ship and go back to Cybertron. Forget about the Decepticons. We can't do that, Mirage. If Megatron succeeds here, he'll be impossible to beat on Cybertron. But we're not fighters like they are, Prime. We must have courage, Huffer. We can't ignore the danger. We must conquer it. So, yeah, like, I when I was in my 20s, I remember, and this is like when I was first starting to get published in comics back in my Antarctic Press days, um, I was working on a... I was going to like try to sell this Transformers story to whatever publishing house had the rights at the time. Cause I think this is by this time, like they were no longer at Marvel. This is after generation two. Right. Um, and I wanted to do a story where it was going to be like how Optimus collected the army that we see in the first miniseries. Like it was the years it, it would take place over a series of years leading up to the first episode of more than meets the eye. And it was going to be, all of these like blue collar workers like Braun was going to work in like some some kind of machinist like sort of uh, not a miner but he's going to like do like heavy machinery kind of work and Huffer was some kind of energon farmer and and so on like they're all these, these various people around Cybertron were like I don't care about the war it's not affecting me but then like the war comes to their neighborhood and wrecks up their lives and then in the battle they see this heroic legendary figure and like we don't even see optimus's face like we don't see it from huffer's perspective we'd see optimus's chest as he walks by and fights megatron like and they're and they're all individually inspired to join this guy this this magnetic charismatic person i'll never do that story because i don't think it's all that great of an idea (laughs) (laughs) looking back at it but when i was in my 20s like this is my fanfic is like the story of how each and every one of these old grizzled uh Autobot, like blue collar Autobots, became these heroes, and it was all from that line where Huffer's like, "We're not fighters, like they are. We're civilians, right?" That's the implication of what he says there. Yeah, it's, it's it just reinforces the concept of the Autobots are at the severe disadvantage here. They are struggling to, you know, battle back the Decepticons. They're at an advantage, just like the Rebels are in the Star Wars series of films. Mm-hmm. 
So go back to the Decepticons, and what are they up to? Well, immediately they start harv- harvesting more energon cubes, and now there's plenty of Seekers all over the place, so somehow they picked up a lot of more guys. There's purple and blue jets. There's just everywhere, and there's one pan that goes through the scene, and they show seven Seekers at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys just keep turning up. I don't know if Soundwave's got a 3D printer in the back room or what's going on. <laughs> but it only has purple ink. Because, <laughs> <laughs> well, Megatron does seem to have a thing for purple, so maybe that was it. It's like, oh, I'll mm-hmm. make some more jets for you, Megatron. Any color that you'd like? I can do yellow, <laughs> I can do red. Soundwave, come on, you know me. There's only one color I ever want to see. <laughs> look, at, look at my house. Look at my spaceship. <laughs> That's the real reason he hates Starscream, is there's no purple on him. <laughs> I mean, look at you. You're red, blue, and gray. You might as well be Optimus. Oh, God, get out of my sight. <laughs> now, now, Skywarp, now there's a guy who knows how to dress. <laughs> Space Cruiser nearly complete. And the Energon Cubes. 3,000 astroliters more required. So not only are there astro seconds, there's astro leaders. And Space let's, measurement. let's remember, folks, that astro is really just means space. So <laughs> they're saying we need five more space leaders, essentially. Which which I am again, I am totally fine with. Mega Miles, <laughs> Astro Leaders. That all makes me happy. Uh, the, I, I think it was the Silverhawk series. Like they actually call them space bucks. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm, I'm in. Uh, I, I, I pray that like ten thousand years from now, if, if human, if man will survive, uh, and we're colonizing other planets, we will finally use uh, astro money <laughs> and use astro astro seconds and astro le- leaders. Um, Oh, that's right. So now they're talking about, you know, it's like we only need like 3,000 more Astro Leaders. And then like Megatron starts thinking, like fantasizing about ruby crystals. <laughs> <laughs> like he's daydreaming about it right there next to Soundwave. Oh, ruby crystals. That, that'll give us the energy we need. And then he's distracted. His, his fantasizing and ruminations are, are rudely interrupted by the sound <laughs> of lasers. <laughs> Starscream, what in the universe are you doing? <laughs> and yes, Megatron turns into strong bad. <laughs> <laughs> Deleted Starscream. <laughs> <sighs> so, uh, what what is Starscream doing? He's like, he's got a gun. He's just like shooting mountaintops. <laughs> <laughs> he's just testing the energon cubes to make sure they work. Well, actually, that's that's actually prudent, <laughs> isn't it? Well, it's probably not prudent in the way that Starscream is doing it. Because Starscream <laughs> can't do anything right. <laughs> what was that? Starscream! What in the universe are you doing? Testing the Energon Cubes! They work! Of course they work! You didn't know! You never tested them! I proved it! You only proved your defective mentality! Now we need two strikes before we'll have enough energy to return to Cybertron! What's the difference? There's plenty here for us! The difference is time, you fool! You set a trap! But now, now we get a little bit of a flip, right? Where it's like, early in episode one, Megatron's like, you fool, Starscream, this is only a small fraction of the energy we need. We must suck this planet Earth dry. Well, now, Starscream's like, what's the difference? There's plenty here for us. <laughs> and then Megatron is now suddenly, he's all ready to go home. And he's like, the difference is time, you know? And he, he kicks Starscream's gun and wrecks it. <laughs> this is where we find out that they're being spied on, right? While they're arguing. Yeah, apparently there's a picnic and Trailbreaker and Spike and Sparkplug are hanging out and using a radar dish to overhear Megatron's plans. And once again, all the most convenient times to overhear Megatron are happening. So uh, the Autobots are tuned in exactly to what his plan is. Oh, that's right. Yes, because while they're arguing, 
Soundwave is like he suddenly his chest lights up. <laughs> that he's like, because that's that's the way he goes. Ding! I got an idea, and he says, uh, "Hey, you know, rocket fuel is pretty good too. I mean, I know you like ruby crystals. I know that they make you foam at the mouth, but you know, we could always go on a rocket fuel uh, <laughs> trip and fill up on that too." And then yes, we cut to Spike and Sparkplug who are listening on the radio, and then Megatron says, "Okay." Nobody's listening, right? Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go get some <laughs> ruby crystals. Then we're going to get some rocket fuel. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> it's a good thing no Autobots can hear us right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, they turn their radio off just as things start to get a little spicy <laughs> back at Decepticon headquarters because Starscream's like, all right, I'm done. I'm done here. Don't push me, Megatron. My desire for power is as great as yours. Power flows to the one who knows how. Desire alone is not enough. Time makes all things possible. I can wait. Yeah, so Starscream isn't going to let a Megatron plan go without commentary. So Mm -hmm. now Starscream's, Starscream's getting a little heated, saying, don't push me, Megatron. And they start trading Maxim's power flows to the one who knows how. Well, time makes all things possible. Well, a stitch in time saves nine. (laughs) They're both like reading from Ben Franklin's books. (laughs) Well, look both ways before crossing the street, Megatron. (laughs) A washed pot never boils, Starscream. (laughs) <laughs> a penny saved is a penny earned. This is this is their rap battles. <laughs> uh, but then finally, like Megatron's like, all right, all right, yeah, fine. You you can win this verbal battle because I'm going to assemble the Strike Force because mm-hmm. I've got I've got work to do. And Strike Force is assembled, and they scramble to the Crystal Mines of Burma. Yeah, and apparently assemble the strike force means 3D print some more troops because now <laughs> there's another huge pan where there's not three, but seven reflector robots, <laughs> a purple seeker, a, f- a second thundercracker colored seeker, a yellow rumble, an orange rumble, and, <laughs> and two light blue rumbles. So apparently uh, Sunwave ran out of the purple ink. So he said, we have a lot of yellow and orange ink. I'll use that. And Rumble was his favorite song. So he made more Rumbles. <laughs> yeah. So so here's a question for you. What are the names of Orange and Yellow Rumble? Orange Rumble would be uh, Sunspot. And uh, let's see. A yellow Rumble. Uh, oh, what would he be called? What would he be called? Hmm. So we got Thundercracker. Do we have like Lightning Strike? Mm. Is it, was that name already been taken? Sounds good to me. Uh, yellow Rumble, Orange Rumble, and two light blue Rumbles. Um, yeah, <laughs> they would they would be partly cloudy, and one would be partly, the other would be cloudy, and they're best <laughs> friends. <laughs> <I'm> like we're best friends. They say that all the time. <laughs> like a like oh. <laughs> We're going in together because we're best friends. Okay, so folks, <laughs> write into tfwiki.net and get that get that listed on there. <laughs> and then Megatron's like, Sonwave, please stop printing these guys. <laughs> What's interesting <laughs> is that none of these guys are Frenzy. So <laughs> Frenzy still has yet to debut. Yeah. Is he like two episodes? Is that right? Something like that. We're going to count them as we go, though, or somebody's going to count them. I wonder who it could be. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then, like, the Trailbreaker is going home with Spike and Spark Plug, and uh, suddenly, because the Strike Force was assembled, they must have spotted Trailbreaker from the, on the ground, and they start shoot. Uh, two jets start shooting at him. Yep. We'll find and out they're who both jets Purple are Seekers, so they're, it's not Starscream, it's not Skywarp, it's not Thundercracker. Maybe one of them is Hotlink? Who knows? And 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 Spike gets a little passive aggressive on poor Trailbreaker. Can't you go any faster? <laughs> and sorry, this is it. I'm not built for speed, which is another line that that harkens to his foul card, where it's like Trailbreaker is he's insecure about the fact that he's not the strongest or fastest Autobot. Mm. Like there's actually something in there about like how uh, in the in the Transformers Universe comic book, uh, which was a collection an expanded version of the file cards, like it says something like Optimus like has hard, a hard time convincing him of his value. 
Hmm. So, so when Spike said that, that hurt. <laughs> Like, sorry, jeez. <laughs> I'm, I'm already driving for you. I'm already a, like a sentient robot, you know, way more powerful than you and can protect you from these guys. But yeah, uh, give me get me a better engine so I can go faster. <laughs> and then Sparkplug is is utterly capable and competent. So he's like, oh, I've got this. And so he picks hmm. up the radio. <laughs> he's got this. If it's one thing I know how to do, it's scream for help. <laughs> Watch, watch me do what humans do best in this series. <laughs> Spark plug to Autobots. We're being attacked by Decepticons. Send help and hurry. Sunstreaker and Sideswipe finally get a line. Yep, they finally show up. Sideswipe's been in the background all this time. I don't think we've even seen Sunstreaker yet. If so, he's just been in the background. So they show up and they start scrapping with the two purple jets. Sunstreaker is portrayed by Corey Burton. Sideswipe is Michael Bell. And so they start sassing the Jets. And we hear a lot of dialogue from Sunstreaker that really shows that he's a pretty vain guy. He's like Vanity Smurf here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's uh, uh, he'd, He would be the bad kid in a John Hughes movie, right? He'd be the guy who gives Molly Ringwald a hard time. Um <laughs> And then Sideswipe is more like uh, the, the buddy sidekick in, in one of those 80s movies, right? We're going to talk more about them in episodes to come. I do, this is, I feel like, a lost opportunity with those two characters. I wish they did more with them. Like, like mm. the, the fact that they call each other brother, right? And yeah. it says in their foul cards that they're brothers. Yep. And that they're both, like, the hot shots who get in over their heads a lot, like, at least in a couple episodes. Mm-hmm. And they're both Lamborghinis, which in the 80s was, like, the epitome of the awesome car. I mean, I literally had a Lamborghini poster on my wall. That's like that's like almost like TV kids bedroom poster. Yeah, <laughs> Lamborghini yeah. poster, and it, it was red too, so it may as well have been sideswipe. <laughs> But yeah, so then, then Sunstreaker is like, ah, oh, you wrecked my paint, and the like, gun comes out of the rear part of the car and shoots one of the jets, and now like one of the purple jets gets two. Of the purple jets get lines of dialogue that indicate they are not the original Seekers. Yep. Yeah, this is definitely not Thundercracker and Skywarp, kids. I'm heading in for repairs. I'll shadow you back. And it sounds to me like it might be Frank Welker, but the second one is John Stevenson. Second one's most likely John Stevenson. I thought the first one sounded like Michael Bell doing his like scrapper voice mm, from the construction. Could be, yeah. So as they drive away and sideswipes like being, you know, kind of glib with his twin brother about how upset he is about his paint getting wrecked, uh, we go see the Decepticons are in the mines. And uh, this is the scene where Starscream's just like yelling at everybody, right? <laughs> well, he does what he does best. He gives orders, <laughs> tells people what to do. <laughs> And uh, this is another, I think, I feel like a, a fairly iconic scene of like, because uh, this got used in the recap by Victor Crowley in the next episode where Megatron is like, sort of like making it rain. <laughs> <laughs> Just throwing the crystals up in the air and they're falling to the ground around him. Yeah, he's just, he's like, oh, this place is magnificent, unbelievable. And then he starts once again t- talking out loud about his plan to build an ultimate weapon <laughs> and then starts tossing the ruby crystals over his head and laughing. <laughs> and then we cut back to outside the, the mine and it's like it's up this long road uh, that goes up a hill to the entrance of the mine. And we see the Autobots standing outside and like contemplating what they're going to do. Megatron and the other Decepticons must be inside the mine. Let's blast their tail runners out of there. Okay, so the Autobots' great plan is to sneak a bomb into the cave, and somehow mm-hmm. Sparkplug is familiar with his cave, which is in Burma. So apparently Sparkplug gets around, and he's worked these mines before, he says. His hard hat goes wherever it's needed. <laughs> now, see, now that is a pitch to IDW, is that it would do a spark, a young Sparkplug Adventures, like the young oh, Indiana Jones Adventures. Oh, I'm fascinated adventures. already. <laughs> Can I cancel that book before it before it even exists? <laughs> <laughs> all the jobs that Sparkplug ever did, and all the times he had to scream for help. <laughs> <laughs> no, you think Spike that I use? Uh, this is the first time I ever screamed for help. Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> let's 
long before I met your mother. <laughs> uh, but but actually, this is again to defend the humans. He's like, I'll go. I'm gonna go in there with a gig- like what is to me a gigantic explosive device. This thing's as big as a trash can, and I'll I'll take this thing and I'm gonna go into this mine where there's you know hundreds of purple jets that would could kill me, uh, and 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 who knows how many different colored rumbles are in there that could kill me. <laughs> And I'm going to sneak in there, and I'm going to hide this thing, and then I'm going to run away. I'm going to try to get back to you guys before the thing blows up. That's courage. I'll go. I've worked these mines. I know my way around. And since I'm the smallest, I have the best chance of getting through. I'll stick that bomb right under their nose gear. Hop in, spark plug. Yeah, and Bumblebee, right? Like, this is what makes what made me just fall head over heels for the character, is that, like, He's the smallest. He's physically the weakest, right? So, again, from think about the standpoint of an 11-year-old who's having power fantasies through this show about all these old, capable, confident guys. And then there's the smallest guy, and he's like, well, I'm the smallest one, so I have the best chance of doing this mission. Hey, guess what? My smallness is an advantage mm-hmm. in this particular situation. They're going to go inside the mine together, and they drive up, and then they walk in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's like they drive what seems to be about 20 feet, and then they <laughs> transform again and walk in. And then, like, it's not it's not long while they're in there before it's all of a sudden, what's that? And we see Skywarp and Thundercracker just, like, walking in. And, of course, Thundercracker is just, like, talking about work. <laughs> <laughs> they're just pushing a car full of rubies. And uh, Thundercracker is talking about Earth. He's complaining about it. He says it's too flat. So Thundercracker <laughs> is a flat earther. Oh, yep. That it goes with the voice. I also just like that, like when Megatron is like hanging out with his friends, he's always talking about his big dreams and aspirations. <laughs> Thundercracker <laughs> just complains about his coworkers <laughs> and about his situation. <laughs> Again, very atypical for the Decepticons. This this guy, this grumpy old guy, he's just <laughs> lamenting his task or saying Earth sucks. And, you know, he's just he's just. He sticks out, and that makes me mm-hmm. like a character a lot of the times. Yeah, he's he's unique among the Decepticons. Um, and then like they they see Bumblebee, and like they like was it Skywarp like just slaps Sparkplug, who just flies across <laughs> the room and hits the wall. Well, and Bumblebee actually out. manages to su- successfully plant the bomb, but That's it's right. not soon after that Thundercracker and Skywarp see them. So yeah. literally, it, it's just as you say, the Thundercracker and Skywarp are like slapping the crap out of Bumblebee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah they like they just pick him up and they just like, kind of like slap yeah. him across the face and then he's like on his back and he's unconscious yeah no no uh arm cannons necessary just hey look it's the little guy let's beat him up <laughs> and, and, and this is one of those things that makes me love him all the more because like that's how brave bumblebee is like he just went ran into thundercracker and skywarp two of the higher ranking dudes two of the toughest dudes and he runs into them you know he's like okay well this is what's gonna happen this is what's gonna happen and then, so they knock him down, and then there's that, this scene stuck out. I, I do, I don't have a lot of, like, really strong memories of watching the very first miniseries. Uh, I've, I've noted them as they've happened, but this is one that really hung on me, is when Bumblebee falls, and his face is facing the camera, and his head's upside down, like he lands on his back, and he's unconscious. Mm-hmm. And just seeing that cute, peaceful face, and, and seeing how brave he was in that moment, like, that felt really upsetting to me. That felt scary to me. Like, the Thundercracker and Skywarp actually seemed kind of menacing to me as a little kid in the scene and of course what do they do they gloat mm-hmm. let's give megatron a little present <laughs> maybe we ought to wrap him up and put a little bow on him <laughs> <laughs> you know i i once heard uh someone talk about like people who don't laugh with joy but just laugh at other people <laughs> <laughs> thundercracker's one of he's one of the latter <laughs> like he only laughs if you tell him a truly tasteless joke or if somebody else is humiliated he never laughs with happiness <laughs> uh so meanwhile the autobots are outside going like okay it seems like oh and we we see the timer on the bomb it's counting down we've got 60 mm-hmm. seconds and it's already been like 20 something seconds right so we don't have long Autobots don't know this, though. Like, Jazz is just wondering a lot. He's like, well, they should be done by now. What's going on? Mm-hmm. 
Ironhide's like, well, I'll go check it out because I am an awesome minivan who could make rivers after all. And Optimus's <laughs> like, no, it's time to let the kids know about some other exciting toy uh, playability features of the Optimus Prime figure, which you can get at your local Toys R Us. Tell your parents, kids, I'll use Roller. He's the ne he's even smaller than Bumblebee, and he can get in there without being seen. Now the other robots are like, well, we can't, you can't let you go alone up that hill that we can clearly see from here. Uh, <laughs> Optimus is like, stay there. If I'm not back in five minutes, come get me. Turns into truck <laughs> mode, drives up the hill. Prime gets to the cave and mm. he opens up the back gate of his trailer and out comes Roller, who sounds like R2-D2. <laughs> Roller apparently doesn't have like a typical uh, Autobot voice. He seems to be sentient, but he doesn't talk or anything. He just makes boops and whistles like R2-D2. And we know he's sentient because Optimus talks to him. Mm-hmm. But other than that, he's kind of mysterious, mainly because this is pretty much the last we'll ever see of him. <laughs> That's true. If we don't see Roller again, I don't think. Uh, but yes, so he calls out to Roller, gives him his charge. It's up to you, Roller. Find out what's going on in there. And be careful. And now we get to a cliffhanger that this, this did, this had an effect on me when I was a kid. It seemed pretty intense because of the, the shot of the explosion coming out of the mountain and knocking Optimus sideways. Not the rolling down the hill. It's that first shot of the explosion coming out of the cave. Mm. And like the way his, his, his uh, tractor trailer twists in opposition to the, the, the trailer aspect. And the fact that he, his first thought is he calls after Roller. Right. right? Yeah. He's always thinking about others. Ah, oh, he's so good. <laughs> and, then, and then he's rolling down the hill clearly hurt from the explosion and jazz calls out to him prime um, and we fade to black and when he's tumbling down that hill he's just man that looks painful mhm mm yeah he's not rolling on his wheels he's tumbling mm, yeah no, he's, he's tumbling he's sideways trucks aren't supposed to go style. that way yeah that's right <laughs> And then, yes, the, the, the music crescendos again with, like, the big cliffhanger music, and then it fades to black, and that's all we get until the next episode. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Clearly, Optimus is dead. What will the Autobots do now? Well, worse, Bumblebee's dead, and yeah, Sparkplug is dead. Everybody's dead. dead. <laughs> the Decepticons are triumphant. Thundercracker's no, the laughing. <laughs> <laughs> Would that be the next time teaser? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> next time in part three, of more than meets the eye, it's just Thundercrack going. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just, it's, it's Skywarp sitting next to him reading really, really tasteless limericks and then Thundercracker laughing at the end of each one of them. <laughs> <laughs> We're going in a whole new direction, kids. <laughs> Oh, it's going to be animated on Fox. Okay. So any other like like uh, 10,000 feet up reflections about this episode? Well, I guess the thing that's most interesting to me is how they felt. Even though the Decepticons, you know, their numbers don't really matter in this situation. They felt the need to create these extra characters out of nowhere. It's like they really aren't that needed script wise. You know, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter how many Decepticons are, like, pushing carts in the dam. I mean, it's, right. it's not like our little seven-year-old minds are going, wait a minute, you, you can't uh, mine those that number of ruby crystals with only 12 Decepticons. It's like, what are you trying to pull <laughs> on me here? Laserbeak could not push that cart. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So it's just kind of an interesting, odd way to go with it. Yeah, you know, it, I, it, there there are several pieces of this original series that feels like they were sort of figuring it out as they went, and this is one of them where I felt it feels like some executive came in the room or somebody came in the room and said like, "Well, gosh, there's only like twelve bad guys, eleven bad guys. Um, we need to make this look more intense and like evenly met because there's so many Autobots. So can we just have a scene where just add some extra guys, <laughs> you know?" And then, like, somebody somebody would probably say, like, well, but where are they going to be in the story, then, if we add more guys? Like, do we have to, like, add more people to the Bible? No, no, they just died. They died in the battle. Don't worry about <laughs> it. 
but like it's like strike when i you say strike force like strike force assembled like it, mm-hmm. that could be six people it doesn't have to be that many reflectors you know right yeah i like the idea of there being like additional seekers if they're gonna throw in anyone else because it's almost been established by the fact that there's three that there's mm-hmm. probably more than three you know unlike a guy like say like you aren't expecting like multiple sound waves for example but uh <laughs> right <laughs> with with three jets there from the beginning, or actually more than three if you count the last episode, it's like we can kind of expect they're sort of like the quote unquote army builder of the team. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. when they uh, show like different colored rumbles and reflectors, that kind of irritates me. Mm. I don't know. I think I think we I I did I you know all the years I've watched this show. I did not realize there was an orange and yellow rumble. Yeah, it's, it's only pretty much in just one shot. There's like right after he says assemble a strike force, there's one pan that's a really long pan. They're all pretty much lined up in a row. Mm. And if you look at the very back, there's a little orange guy, a little yellow guy, and they're rumble shaped. <laughs> and don't forget partly cloudy. <laughs> two best friends. <laughs> Our new fanfic. <laughs> <laughs> They uh, they record all the weather reports. <laughs> Another clear day on Cybertron, everybody. There's no clouds, just outer space. <laughs> this has been your weather report from Partly and Cloudy. We're best friends. They high five. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to have to paint a rumble figure into those guys. <laughs> Oh, it, it, this is that would be the kind of character who would have shown up either in Transformers Animated or in Transformers R.I.D. from 2001, and I would have loved him with all my heart. <laughs> uh, okay, well, yeah, uh, exciting, you know, second act. Decepticons, uh, the, well, the interesting thing about this one, too, is that it, it appears that the Decepticons are dead and some of our heroes are dead and our the, the, the life of our you know leader is in jeopardy. You know, victory, but at what cost, right? So that that is a, a cool way to close things out before we go into the, the climactic finale of More Than Meets the Eye. So, and you can hear we'll... all about that next week here at Four Million Years Later. Dot com. Okay, <laughs> uh, so thank you, Hoover. This was fun, and we'll be back next week. Until then, I have been Jersey Drozd of Four Million Years Later dot com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. Jdrozd dot com is where if you want to find all my stuff. Uh, actually, if you want to if you want to get a feed of everything I'm up to, it's rss dot dot com. That's I pump all of my different media feeds into that one, so you can get like the 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 heartbeat of my production as a cartoonist <laughs> is there. Excellent. All right, we'll be back next time. And until then, uh, I've been Jersey. I've been Hoover. Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas Mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4 Million Years Later dot com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>